In this lecture, we will sur survey the <coughs> establishment of the new, well, or less than new, uh, states and political systems in Central Eastern Europe um, after 1989, so after the end of communism, focusing in this specific lecture on uh, Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia, later the Czech Republic. Um, then, in the, in the next lecture, we will deal with uh, uh, Hungary and uh, Romania. Okay, so here is where uh, your knowledge and uh, understanding of these key terms in political science, namely state versus political system, needs to be uh, well, very <laughs> solid. Uh, because uh, <coughs> what happens after 1989 uh, will affect separately these things, right? Uh, so what is a state, right? So to review, uh, a state is a set of institutions with sovereign power or territorial membership, right? Uh, we usually associate it with a set of boundaries, of borders, but those borders don't just, don't exist, right? They're conventions. They are um, something we draw to express what? That there is a set of institution that has exclusive rights to make rules and to enforce rules in the territory, right? And that's a state. Now, Based on this definition, you already know, and we have talked about the history of these, you know, peoples, countries, and whatever. But we have talked about something called Poland back in the 13th century. We have talked about something called Poland in the 15th century. We have talked about something called Poland in the 20th century, at the beginning, in the middle, during communism, and thereafter. So, we are talking about a state of Poland, which, by the way, you know that also the borders changed, and which for a while disappeared. So, so what happened with the Polish people, right, who, when the state disappeared, did they disappear, were they abduct, abducted by aliens, or, or what is the, what happened, right? And that is the difference between state and, well, nation, right? Nation in the modern sense, right? So you see the difference. Poland disappears as a state, the uh, cultural entity, the, that group of people united by a common identity, which is the uh, definition of nationhood, that uh, remained, and actually it formed itself in the absence of the state. It defined itself in the modern sense in the, Afro, uh, in, the abs in the absence of actual statehood. And then it claimed statehood after World War I. Right? So that's state and nation. But how, the, how about the political system? Well, <clears throat> again, given that we have talked about the state of a state called Poland uh, since the Middle Ages and earlier, uh, clearly they have had many types of governments, many sorts of governments since then, and that is a political system. So if a, if a, if a state is a set of institutions in, uh, with sovereign power over territory and membership, the political system is how those institutions are set up. What institutions of government exist, what is their role, what is the relationship between them, and so on. And we talked about the fact that there are three major uh, types of um, democratic political systems, right, in a liberal democracy, uh, and uh, parliamentary, presidential, and semi-presidential, or hybrid, as your, the textbook that I posted uh, calls, them, calls it. Um, and what is different between these, uh, ver these varieties of, right, these types of representative democracies, of liberal democracies, is the specific role that, each, that the key institutions play here, namely the interaction between the legislature and the executive especially, is that the different type of institutions within the executive and the interaction of the executive with the legislature is what gives the nature of these different uh, uh, types. So in our examination we need to ask the question, what happens to the state of, say, Poland after 1999? Right? Because changing statehood means changing that in, 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 uh, right? in, in how many institutions and what kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, how many borders there are, so to speak, right? We'll, we'll talk about this in a second, right? Um, and how many levels of government there are, right? And we're talking about unitary state, federal state, confederal state, we talked about that, right? Which is the difference, uh, it's still a, a set of institutions with sovereign power over territory and membership, but in a federal system, right, the two, they're distributed equally on two levels. In a unitary state, there's only one level of, that has exclusive power and so on. So we have to ask about the state, but we also have, uh, have to ask about the political system. Now, what we know about the political system, which is common for all these countries, which is why we study 
1989 and what was before 1989 and what is after, because you have a transition, right, from a totalitarian or authoritarian system, depends on the country, to a liberal democracy. And this is a key issue, which is called democratization. How do you move from a totalitarian or authoritarian system, which were these countries under communist regimes, one party, and so on, to a liberal democracy, which is characterized by those four things that we mentioned, right? Free and fair elections, limited and accountable government, um, um, uh, human and uh, civil and political rights, and the rule of law. How do you move from this, right? And it's still an issue, because we're talking about today, uh, it's an issue around the world, but for example, in current East current day events, right? We're talking about Iraq and Afghanistan and the Arab Spring and their transition and their botched transitions and so on. It's not a it's not a simple thing. It's not a unidirectional thing. And the fact that all of these countries, and this is the, the great thing, that all the countries of Central Eastern Europe, even Serbia later, will actually transition to a democratic state. That is a, that is something that is something to be remarked. Because we look today at the, in 2015 at the, at the countries that went through the Arab Spring and we see that many of them or some of them have reverted to authoritarian or uh, illiberal democracies. Uh, others have a civil war raging, you know, like Syria, millions of refugees flowing into other continents. So you see, this is, it's not a, it's not a unidirectional thing. It's not like you just clap your hands and there is huge democracy. This is why studying this area uh, you know, is, is, a, is a laboratory for so many things that are key to understanding politics. From nationalism to the nation state, to the rise of the modern state, to and on and on and on, to what we're doing to, with, uh, in this section, transition from a totalitarian, authoritarian regime to a liberal democracy. So that's what we're going to examine. And in this lecture, let's look at the, how the state and the political system was changed in Poland and in well, Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic. So what happens in Poland, right? Well, does the state change? It doesn't change, right? The, the borders does not, do not change. Remember that after World War II, the borders of Poland did change. Um, uh, because Poland was moved, basically, just like Germany was moved because of the Soviet Union. Literally, the borders were shifted uh, westward. Uh, the state does not change. So today, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, Poland, we still have a state, and what form does it have? Is it federal? No, it is a unitary state. And that's important to understand. Okay? We will do specific case studies of in-depth of today's politics in the next section of each of these countries. Now we are studying transition. So that's the first thing. Uh, let's just re review what happened immediately after 1989, right? 1989, the roundtable talks and so on. Uh, two major actors, the Communist Party and the reformists within that, and Solidarity, right? And Solidarity wins, the, wins the, those uh, half elections and then uh, wins the next three elections, so, uh, but it quickly breaks apart into other parties, which we will examine in the next section, right? So that's what happens. Basically, the opposition to the Communists takes power in 1989, 1990, and it's, then it breaks apart in other parties, but that's, that's the key uh, uh, event there. Okay, good. So the state remains unitary. Okay, and then let's look at the political system. So again, the question becomes here, like what do we build? Right? And it's not a blank slate, because you already have some institutions. The same, which remember, goes back to, uh, to the Middle Ages, right? Which was the diet of the nobles, right? But it was called the same in, in Poland, right? They elected the king. But that subsisted even during communism, even if it wasn't really powerful. It was dominated by the Communist Party. It was just a tool, right? But it remains. So, um, it is part of the Polish, uh, you know, heritage. So it is kept. The same is kept. But then what do you do? Uh, remember that historically Poland won, was, had a bicameral parliament, right? And that's, what, that's a common conundrum to all these countries, right? When they move from a communist system, which didn't have, you know, a, a multi-party, many parties, a competition and so on, uh, what do you keep and what do you um, get rid of? Because remember, during communism, many, in many of these countries, they kept 
a formal parliament, which was a, just a tool, just a, just a formality. Do you keep that? Do you transform that? Do you add something? I mean, that's the, that's the issue. So you start with what you have, that's one. Then you hearken back to uh, historical uh, legacies. Uh, we always had two chambers. You probably was gonna, we, will want to re-establish that to, make, to, uh, to repair what the communists, communists had ruined. Right? And that will be the case of Poland. Because they will re-establish both uh, chambers. So one source is what there is. The other source is history because that communism is experienced at this point as a sort of an accident of history. As a sort of a dark night of the nation, of the country, right? Uh, from which we wake up and we want to redo it. This is why they re-give back property and so on. So the second source is history, proud history. Third source is what's Examples from around, from successful democracies, right? uh, which might be mostly from Europe. Uh, as you see, none of these uh, political systems will take the, the US model, at least not as a presidential model. There is no presidential system in, in Europe, actually, you know, uh, in democratic Europe, yeah, among the democratic countries in Europe. Right? No presidential system. It's either parliamentary or semi-presidential, variations of this. So, but you look at the neighboring uh, or existing countries, including those which historically have been uh, taken as models. And for Poland, if you remember, France has always been a model. And the French culture, which has been one of the important sources of, 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 uh, and models in, around the world in the last two centuries before uh, World War II. Uh, so the French affiliation is there <coughs> more than any other. Same you will see in, um, in, uh, in Romania, which has a strong French affiliation, right? So cultural models. Hungary, uh, uh, on the other hand, you will see, uh, has had a historical affiliation with Germany. So you will see the German model. And you will see that reflected in aspects of their political system. So that's interesting. So when you build the political system, you don't build it from scratch. That's the point. You always start from something. The US, when it was founded, it started from something as well, but we won't go into that. So these are the so three sources, right? What there is, history, models from around, and we can add the fourth one. And the fourth uh, source is the specific political context within which these institutions are formed. Let me, the example of Poland is perfect, because Poland will establish a semi-presidential political system. A same presidential political system with a powerful president. And you're going to ask, why? Why? Well, there's the French model, which is semi-presidential. They, they have basically invented the model. Uh, but then there's also Lech Walesa. There's also Lech Walesa. There's also the history, history of Poland with strong uh, leaders. Think of Marshal Pilsudski and so on, right? So the need for a strong ruler. But... Uh, Lech Walesa, the most important figure in the opposition, in the anti-communist opposition in Poland, right? the leader of the revolution in many ways, of the, of the changes in 1990 in many ways, right? the, the moral leader. Right? <clears throat> what do you do with him? What do you put him? Right? That leadership carries over. Right? So when he is elected as president, he brings his authority into this office, and it's during this time that this, the political system is shaped. And he will play a role in shaping this political system, in shaping the presidency based on his own you know, likeness, based on his likeness. So a strong personality will shape strong uh, uh, positions in the political system, just like Lincoln had an impact on the American presidency, changing its nature, becoming much more aggressive, it never was powerful, right? And other, at other points in time, you know, um, it also happened. Uh, it's just like the French, in the French case, the current political system was shaped by de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, who was a very powerful authority figure in French politics, society, military, right? And he basically designed the political system to fit him. And it was desi des designed around him. So this is also very important. So the fourth thing, the fourth thing that immediate context. Okay. So uh, initially, then the political system that is, that is established is a strong, is a strong semi-presidential, semi-presidential. And by strong, I mean that the president is strong. 
right? And that fits the French model, you know, from the other election. Okay, so here's then the, pre uh, the president, there's a prime minister, there's a cabinet, right? And this is the executive branch, right? And then you have a lower house, which is the same, and they will re-establish an upper house, which is the Senate. Which is the uh, Senate. And that was, you know, the reclaiming of, of, of history, the reclaiming of the historical uh, uh, legacy, right? So, uh, just like in other uh, presidential systems, the president, semi-presidential systems, sorry, the, what are the institutions that are directly elected? Uh, there's first of all the parliament, right? Uh, and in this case, both houses are elected by the population. But it's typical for semi presidential systems, as has been explained in the previous uh, lectures about uh, part, um, political systems, the president is also directly elected. And remember that in a democracy, legitimacy comes from election. Power, in fact, comes from election. So it, it would be impossible for, for a system to have a strong president if it's not directly elected. Right? So uh, what what uh, the, so he will be directly elected, and the president is indeed directly elected um, by uh, the population, and we'll talk about how uh, and, and so on. Right? Then you have the PM and cabinet. Now, the conundrum of a semi-presidential system in in general, what I mean, what is the what are the advantages? Why would a country choose a semi-presidential system? It, it chooses it because it also it gives power to the and uh, to the to the elective body to the elected legislature, which is sort of the essence of democracy. The essence of representative democracy is that the people elect the legislature. The people elect those who make the laws. That's the essence of democracy. This is why in the constitution, according to the constitution in the U.S., right. Congress has the most power. Congress has the most power. Okay? Because that's the essence of democracy. So it keeps that, but it also establishes a clear leadership by electing directly the president. Okay? And you say, oh, that's nice. It's a combination of parliamentary power with executive power. Combination, but also problems. Because it's not the presidential system. These powers are not separate. <coughs> they need to interact. They need to interact. In, uh, all of these institutions are involved in lawmaking. And this is where the conundrums come. Conundrum come. And, and kind of the point of conflict is the PM and the cabinet. And as this has been expl explained in, in other uh, lectures, um, uh, this is a complicated position because, for example, in France, right, if the president nominates and appoints the prime minister, but needs also the support of the of the parliament, of the parliament. So this is a position in between. And, and then how do you distribute the roles? Who is leading the government? This or this? And how do they distribute these roles? So you have the competition between these two positions, and then the competition between this and this. Now, here's where you see the impact of those, uh, of the fact of who is, uh, who are, what is the specific political context at the given time. That Valesa was such a powerful personality, and, you know, when these positions were carved out, when their uh, realm has been carved out, uh, you know, he, he pushed towards more. And your book goes very nicely explaining how he tried to push for more, but the president who came after him withdrew. The point is <coughs> that in a semi-presidential system, there is a sort of a balance between these two. But this balance, which sounds nice on paper, also creates huge problems. Because all, polit all, polit all the political institutions want to have, uh, you know, more power. Uh, all of them want to be the ones that decide. So, you know, you can have problems. Now, the best situation is when you have a majority here in the parliament that is the same coalition of parties from which the president came. So basically the president has his own parties, his own uh, people, so to speak, uh, in majority here. In that case, they work together nicely. In France, that is called unified government. But here's the problem. What if this majority is from a different party? 
Because then the president cannot get his will through here. Right? So then he will have to give in to different things. He cannot, so you see, it's, it's always a give and take. So how did it work out in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, right? So in Poland you have a president who is directly elected, who is head of state, and at first, uh, well it's hard to say that he was also head of executive one, because that would be the, the normal thing, but had some functions of head of executive, let's put it this way. Why well, this is the head of executive. See, already a conundrum that, and, and remember what the different roles are. The head of state is the ceremonial position formally representing the reality of the state, the ongoing reality of the state, while the head of the executive or head of government is the one who runs the government and sets policy. Now, in the semi presidential system, traditionally, uh, the president is also head of executive one, and the other one, uh, P PM, is head of executive two, meaning the broad directions of policy are set by the president and the prime minister mostly executes. That's in France. Here it's not quite like that, and this is why semi presidential systems are more complex and can fluctuate also with who's, who's here and, and the relationship between the actors in the system. Now, in the case of Balesa, he was trying to be more, he was trying to be head of executive one, he was trying to run the country. It also, was also his temperament and so on. But then there was a withdrawal uh, from this, the, the, uh, the next president withdrew from, uh, from this. Uh, so, the president, so let's, let's deal with, with how it looks, you know, since uh, uh, 97. Now remember that in Poland there was a s s small constitution in 92, and uh, another constitution in 97. The small constitution was a sort of a temporary agreement, and then the, 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 the big change uh, was in 97. Uh, with uh, the new constitution, right? And so the system we have to study is basically what happens after 97, but it's, in, it's important and interesting to understand how it got there, right? Because actually the constitution passed in 97 will reflect the period between 90 and 97 where you have all this tug of war between these institutions. So, but let's deal with how it looks uh, today. So the president today uh, doesn't have a free hand at appointing the prime minister as he would in France, but uh, because of these changes in this constitution, appoints the prime minister formally, but based on the majority here, and has a choice of whom to appoint only if there's no clear majority. So let's say the, 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 the same is very fragmented, it's not clear, there is no clear majority, this is when the president has actually a choice of calling this leader of this party to form government to be a PM. If there is a clear majority, according to the new constitution, the president kind of has to choose the leader of this majority. So it's only when there's no majority that the president has some leeway. Okay, you see how it's limited. During Valesa's time, he basically appointed whoever he wanted as prime minister. Okay. Now it has been pushed back. So the president doesn't have a leeway, if there's his majority, he has to appoint the leader of the majority as PM. Because remember, the position of the PM derives its legitimacy from, uh, and, of the, and the cabinet from, from, the, from the parliament. Okay, what else does the president do? Represents Poland abroad, and so on. <sighs> doesn't really shape policy anymore. Doesn't really shape policy anymore. All the, what he can do, shaping policy means this is the laws I want to pass, and, and so on. In France, the president says, okay, we do this, and then the prime minister kind of executes, okay? Simplified, to simplify very brutally. Not important. So he doesn't have that sort of, but laws need to be signed by the president, and since the 97 constitution, also by the prime minister. So when the law is passed by both houses, it needs to be signed by both of these. So you see a check on the president. So overall what you see is that the 97 constitution kind of fought back and cut from the powers of the president by empowering the other institutions in the political system. Which is kind of the reverse of what's going on in the model of semi-presidential system in France, where the president still is the most powerful actor. It's the president who runs the country. Here, it is now the prime minister. A prime minister who is appointed 
So let's talk about the Prime Minister and his cabinet. The Prime Minister is basically the leader of the whoever party or coalition, usually it's coalition of parties, has the majority in the lower house, the same. Okay. S E J M, right? So because in a just like in a parliamentary system, the executive in the cabinet of the prime minister is an embodiment, is a reflection of the parliamentary election. So after each parliamentary election, after each election, they're the same, rather. Depending on the majority that is formed, a new government is formed here. Notice that the president is elected separately. Okay. So the appointment of the PM and the cabinet depends on the parliamentary election. More specifically, the election to the same. Okay, and today the PM is the main engine of policy. It's the PM who shapes policy, but the president is there and hovers there and has a role in, you know, he is on paper the commander-in-chief of the, of the uh, army. He is the guardian of the constitution, it says. That's a huge thing, right? He, to make sure that the whole system works uh, accordingly. He can refer laws that are passed to the constitutional court to, to, for them to be struck down. In the pro Poland, it is, you know, it's these institutions that refer laws to the Constitutional Court. So there are significant powers, right? And yes, he can veto a law, but that can be overridden by um, uh, two, three fifths of a legislature. So the president can veto a law, but it can be overridden by three fifths of each of the houses. Okay. So there is significant power, and it's still. It's, in, it's, it's still a negotiation, right? In the sense that after the next election, elections and whoever becomes president, things might shift. But it's important that the 1907 constitution put significant checks on the power of the president, again, as a reaction partially to how Valesa tries to, try to you know, be more imperial, uh, the, the imperial president. Okay. The PM, so he's in charge with making policy, uh, you know, to, to uh, and just like in a parliamentary system, most laws will be made here and passed through then the parliament, right? So this is the engine of policy making, right? The PM and the cabinet, just like in, in a parliamentary system. He also, or she, appoints his ministers. It didn't used to be this way. It used to be that the president appointed them at the PM's nomination. It's now the PM appoints them and it's these appointments need to be approved by the same. So the PM appoints the members of the cabinet and they need to be approved by the same. But let's talk about the legislature. The same, the lower house is the more powerful house and the Senate is more of a, a house of debate and adjustment. Okay. So, the lower house passes, what are the functions of the lower house, of the same? The lower house the traditional functions of the legislature, right? Passing laws, legislation, legislating Representation, because they represent the population election, right? And oversight. And oversight means oversight of the executive. How does the same exercise oversight? Now, remember that the very appointment of the PM is a result of same elections. So these elections decide who becomes PM, who forms the cabinet. Okay? So it's the parties that win the election that form the cabinet that take power here. Here. So this depends on this. When the PM appoints, who comes from these winning parties, when the PM appoints the members of the cabinet, they need to be approved, the whole cabinet needs to be approved by the same, okay, oversight. The same can remove <coughs> the PM and the cabinet to a so-called, through a so-called uh, constructive vote of no confidence. Now, the vote of no confidence is something that exists in parliamentary and semi-presidential systems. And it, it is based on the same logic. That again, remember, in a democracy, all power comes from the people, and it's exercised through elections. So the mandate to govern needs to be given through election. 
This is why this has the mandate to govern because it's elected, and this has the mandate to govern because it's elected by the people. Where does the mandate of the PM and of the cabinet come from? From the legislature. So from here, but through the legislature. It's a manifestation of this mandate in an executive form. Okay. Good. But that means that this executive rests on the support of the legislature. Okay, this executive, of course, right? Rests on the support of the legislature. And that is confidence. It's called confidence. Can be. Um, and that is manifested when the executive is formed because the same needs to approve the cabinet. And it can also be manifested by withdrawing that confidence, and that is a vote of no confidence. So, in parliamentary systems and semi presidential systems where you have this dimension, you see how it's a mix of the parliamentary and a presidential system, right? Because this is parliamentary, this is presidential. So, in, a, in this system, parliaments can remove the executive, this, by withdrawing confidence. Now, I mentioned that in Poland this happens through a constructive vote of no confidence. And why is it a constructive vote of no confidence? What does it mean? It's the German model. And here's my other thing that I just mentioned. What models do you look at? What are the models that you based on which you build up this political system, how it functions. And Germany has this famous model of a constructive vote of no confidence, and their major role model, although kind of hate, love-hate relationship for the neighbors Poland. And the constructive vote of no confidence is not... Uh, the vote of no confidence, the simple vote of no confidence, is that simply the majority votes here to withdraw confidence, and then government exactly falls, a new government needs to be made. Sometimes. Or maybe elections will happen, or whatever. We don't know what will happen. They just have to resign. A constructive vote of no confidence is, an, is a check against instability. In order to remove a government in a constructive vote of no confidence, the same needs to both vote them out, and within a specific amount of time also have ready another government here to be formed. You're going to say, well, that's simple. No, it's not. Because remember, most of the times you have a coalition here. And often a government falls, meaning confidence is withdrawn from them, because one of the factions, one of the parties, splits from the coalition. And suddenly the coalition doesn't have a majority. So this was the majority coalition. Well, if you remove this party, you don't no longer have a majority. And that's how governments fall. But that also can lead to instability. So the constructive vote of no confidence forces these parties to... They can't just remove the government unless there is ready another majority with perhaps another party which could, can introduce support and vote in another government. So basically, constructive vote of no confidence means that you can only remove the executive if you have another one, if you have support, majority support for another one to replace it. And that is a measure uh, towards the people. So, about 460 members, the same. Senate is an upper house, less powerful, about 100 members. What does the Senate do? All bills need to go through both houses. Yeah? So, which, wherever they're introduced, usually coming from, from the executive, whether they're introduced here, they need to go through the other one. Whether they're introduced here, they need to, to go through the other one. However, uh, the Senate can, uh, you know, amend bills that go through it or uh, approve it. It can even reject it. But here's the thing. If a bill has been passed through the same and goes to the Senate, to the lower house and goes to the upper house, lower being more powerful. If the Senate rejects it, it can go back and the same can bypass that rejection with a, simple, with a, with a vote through with absolute majority. An absolute majority means that it's a majority of all the uh, seats in the house, meaning not only those present. So if there are 460 seats in the house, in the same, right? then uh, you have 231 needed to bypass it. 
Sometimes there are only 400 present, but 201 will not be a, a large enough majority. Anyway, absolute majority is needed to bypass a negative vote from the Senate. But it can be bypassed. This is what makes this more powerful. However, um, in certain issues, uh, the Senate has some, some specific powers. Approving certain positions in the political system, a number of positions, just like the lower house approves other positions, courts, different appointed positions. Um, a point, let's say, by the president needs to be approved by the same or by the Senate and so on. And also the same, uh, the Senate has acquired certain roles in, in, ma uh, in matters, for example, represent, uh, in the relationship between Poland and the EU, European Union. Or the Senate has uh, sort of assumed this responsibility for, uh, for uh, Polonia, which is basically the Polish nation, and by that they mean the Poles, that live outside of the borders of Poland, right? so people of Polish uh, ethnicity, right, who might live in other states, uh, or maybe have immigrated a long time ago in, uh, in America and France and so on, so that's the Polish nation, because again, nation is not the same as state. Just like for 150 years there was no Poland as a state, but there was a Polish nation, or at least they claimed it. Okay. So, uh, so you see, there are some issues, and that's typical for weaker upper houses, just like in France. Uh, weaker upper houses usually cannot bypass, cannot, don't have an absolute veto. They can't absolutely veto laws. The, their negative vote can be bypassed by the lower house, with the exception of certain issues. In many cases, it's constitutional amendments, for example, that where they have a veto. Another thing that upper houses do is that they uh, claim uh, special responsibilities. And again, in France, they claim special responsibility for local government or whatever. Here, the Senate claims responsibility for the Polonia, for the Polish people around, uh, abroad, uh, for um, EU matters, uh, and so on. So, laws come mostly from here, are made, written mostly from here, goes through, go through both houses. This is most powerful, this is less powerful. After they're passed, they need to be signed by both the President and the Prime Minister. That's interesting. President can veto, veto can be bypassed with the three-fifth majority of each of the House. Okay, so in conclusion, what is this Polish uh, political system? Uh, let's, let's just uh, summarize it. It's a semi-presidential political system, as you can see from the very existing, from the, from the type of institutions that exist and the powers they have and how they're elected. But it's a semi-presidential political system which, although at the beginning it has leaned, power has leaned more towards the president, or at least it, tr it tried to lean that way, it has been rebalanced. But the conundrum remains, which is inherent in a semi-presidential political system, the tug of war is inherent in the thing. Because what happens when there's a different majority here, that's always the question, than the party from which the president comes. Or vice versa. You have, you have balanced the system, but what happens when this majority is actually, actually from the same party, uh, is the same majority from which the president comes? Won't the president then implicitly have more power and re-push the power balance towards him? With a decrease in the role of the prime minister. That's the issue in a uh, semi-presidential uh, political system. Uh, right now, however, the president has executive roles, uh, you know, which are more limited than the French model. The prime minister, however, is the main engine of policy, invention of policy, creation of policy, shaping and implementation. So he is in charge with running, uh, or she uh, is in charge with running the government uh, with a strong lower house and a weaker so that's Poland. The next part of the lecture will deal with uh, Czech Republic.